While Israel had been victorious, the cost had been too high. Over 2,600 dead and over 10,000 wounded. Israel had thought of itself after the Six Day War as almost invincible, but the Yom Kippur War proved it was not. While the war had ended in a ceasefire, that ceasefire was fragile on the Egyptian front and not at all existent on the Syrian front. In January, Israel and Egypt agreed to a mutual withdrawal, with Israel withdrawing from the west bank of the canal and Egypt from the east. Negotiations with Syria were more complicated, and until an agreement was reached in May of 1974, Israel was forced to keep most of its reserve soldiers in uniform. When that agreement was reached, it called for Israel to withdraw from all of the lands captured during the 73 war, as well as withdrawing symbolically from Kanetra, a town on the Golan Heights. For many Israelis, the most important aspect of the agreement was the return of the prisoners held by Syria. The wounds continued to remain raw. Throughout the summer of 1974, the war dead who had been hastily buried were reburied in military ceremonies with the families present. In December, with the Israeli troops still fully mobilized, the country held elections, and the Labour Party, led by Golda Meir, was once again victorious. It had enough votes in order to form a government. Before the guns were fully silenced, a public commission, the Agronaut Commission, was empowered to investigate the mistakes made in the war. The commission's initial findings, which were released in April 1974, blamed Israeli military intelligence for the fact that Israel was surprised by the beginning of the war. It blamed the military as a whole for the misconception that the war could not start until the Egyptian Air Force was on par with the Israeli Air Force. The Agronaut Commission absolved the political leadership of responsibility, but the nation did not. Large-scale demonstrations broke out and they forced Prime Minister Golda Meir to resign. She was replaced by Yitzhak Rabin, who was away in Washington as the ambassador during the war. During his first year in power, Rabin had to deal with some of the worst terror attacks Israel had endured, including an attack in Kiryat Shmona that killed 18, and an attack on a school in Ma'alot, which killed 21 children. In its first year, the Rabin government also reached a disengagement agreement with the Egyptians, which saw further Israeli withdrawal from parts of the Sinai Peninsula. As Israel rearmed to make up for the losses of the Yom Kippur War, it also unveiled its first domestically produced fighter bomber, the Kfir. In 1974, the Gush Emunim organization was founded with the goal of settling in all parts of Eretz Israel. They attempted to settle in Sebastia, in the West Bank. In 1975, in a decision that will live in infamy, the United Nations voted to state that Zionism was racism. One of the biggest moments of the period was the miraculous rescue of Israelis held hostage by terrorists in Uganda. In the Entebbe rescue operation called Operation Thunderbolt, Israeli special forces carried out a nearly impossible recovery over 1,000 miles from Israel's borders. In April 1977, it was reported in the Israeli press that Yitzhak Rabin's wife, Leah, had not closed the United States bank account after Rabin completed his assignment as Israeli ambassador to Washington. Rabin resigned as prime minister and was replaced by Shimon Peres. When Peres was forced to call a new election, a true revolution took place. In the election in 1977, the Likud party came to power. After spending nearly 30 years in the opposition, Menachem Begin became Israel's new prime minister.